Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. I'm Sam Moores and with me today I have James Dendity. Hello. Hey, how are you? Very good, very good. Um, can you tell the audience a little bit about sort of who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm James Densley, I'm Chief Technical Director at TDF. Um, and we are sort of a home really for private F1 external from the manufacturers. Um, so we look after a lot of original cars for people. Um, and we also have our own product called the TDF1. And uh, yeah, we're growing. <laughs> How did you, we're, we're based at, um, or you're based, and we are currently here yeah. at Bedford Autodrome. Um, so if you can hear some cars going around in the background, that is literally cars going around the track. Um, how did this all start? How did you start down into a bit of F1 and, and in the automotive space in general anyway? Uh, so I, yeah, I've always been around it. Um, my dad was racing when I was, when I was a kid. Nice. Um, and although I don't really remember it because he did the same racing driver thing as always where you run out of money, mm -hmm. um, it was a sort of ingrained from somewhere and I started pestering when I was quite young to go casting. Um, and then again, we never really had the cash to do that. Uh, and eventually pushed and pushed and pushed and finally got my own way like all kids do, I guess, in the yeah. end. Um, but I was quite late getting into it. So I was sort of 11, 12, which as we all know, is a bit too late. What is what is prime time to get into karting these days? Like two? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like if you can be in there six, testing, get into Bambino, it's got to be the way forward. And then when you get to eight, you can go racing properly. And they, I've, I've been, I've, I've not really done, I've not done much karting at all. And I've been to one proper karting track. And it all looked incredibly serious, but the, the people were very, very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's almost, uh, it almost doesn't quite work with the height. It's like the smaller they are, the more serious it is. <laughs> the parents are just next level. <laughs> yeah, you, I've seen like race trucks and stuff. You know, like what? There's a, why is there a race track at a kid's karting event? But yes, yeah. why not? Trucks, motorhomes. If you can have it in a Grand Prix weekend, you can have it at a karting event for sure. <laughs> So you did a bit of karting and then... Yeah, did some karting, uh, won our British Championship well um, and then tried to step to the cars thing when I was sort of 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, no money. So we had to sort of bail on that. Um, and in the meantime, obviously, sort of school was not really my priority because I was going to be a superstar racing driver. Of course. Um, so uh, I then jumped and went to college when I finished school um, to like look at mechanic and in the meantime we've been helping my mates out karting because it kept me in the kart world could keep talking to yeah. them keep being around it um so did a couple of championships uh as a mechanic and then yeah went to college and i'd been there maybe six months and a friend of mine his dad owned a race team and they i'd sort of pestered him for an opportunity he was going to go and race cars in formula bmw as it was then um and i sort of pestered him and didn't hear anything about it i was like just carry on with college and then out of the blue he just phoned me and said do you want to come and mechanic for us f3 formula bmw i just dropped college and went and did that nice was that quite like learning how to work on those cars because like you know you can be like here's a spanner take that off but at the same time presumably you must have learned so much so fast just getting hands on on these things yeah i think um the turn in spanners bit i think is quite similar no matter what you do um it's just they become more and more complicated. So like Formula BMW was great as a, you know, it's a junior single seater. F3 was, was more complicated, but you like, I'm quite nicely driven by process. Mm. And they're all about that really. They have a, you know, you go through the same things every weekend for each session, all the checklists, everything you do is quite similar. So once you can pick the basics up quite quickly, then you can start to get into more complicated stuff. And then to the, I guess when you're looking at more and more complicated, I get, do the cars come with a manual? Uh, yeah, depending on what they come with, Delara are quite good at providing a manual. It's not, um, the teams tend to do their own thing anyway. Um, so it gives you the, the core basics, but they're not, it's not so useful. Really, you learn more from just getting hands on and doing it and from other people's experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I always see mechanics working on cars at racetracks and stuff and just go, you guys are just so extreme in terms of like the amount of hours put in like inevitably i've done it someone stuffs a car on the last session of a day <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely uh yeah i think working out uh salary by hours as a mechanic in motorsport is the worst thing you could probably ever do yeah. and uh, definitely on the driver's side working out cost per minute driving that's also a really bad oh, one ter terrifyingly <laughs> scary yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So you were doing some mechanicing, you then got to work on this Formula BMW team. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, just worked as hard as I could, really. Um, didn't really have a like burning desire to head in any particular direction. Mm. I just loved doing what I was doing. It wasn't really like being at work. Um, and then from there, the team wasn't the greatest. They were, were running out of budget um, and I had an opportunity to move to uh, one of the other top teams in the championship. So I moved into another team in F3 um, uh, with high tech and we won the championship in 07 with, with asthma. Um, and then the following year we had three cars and when it did Macau and then that was kind of when it stepped into being more serious, more budget, mm. uh, running at the front, more pressure with not making mistakes because uh, they can cost you wins and, and uh, yeah, working with a team that was funded the way it was meant that we got to do a lot because F3 was still open then. So wind tunnel testing and aero testing and lots of car development, all the sort of stuff you did in F1 that you don't really get anymore with the single seater series because they're all one make. Yeah. So it's kind of gone a bit now. Yeah, because I didn't realize that there was much development at all in any of those series, but is there? There used to be. Um, F3 used to be really open. Um, you could within the confines of not changing anything that was a safety thing or uh, some aero components, pretty much everything else was open. So yeah, we had a 60% tunnel model. We had a guy from one of the F1 teams that was our aerodynamicist. Um, we were on seven post <laughs> rigs. We were testing all the time. That was yeah, within the regs, obviously. Um, they, they tried to control that by controlling when you could test. Yeah. Um, but, you know, CFD, wind tunnel, uh, you know, stuff that wasn't on a racetrack, we could we could do because we were funded. Oh wow, that the budget for that season must be extreme. Y yeah, it was. Yeah, it wasn't cheap. I, I mean, definitely a few uh, a few above a million. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, and that was privately funded. Um, but yeah, it, may, it meant that we got to get our heads around a lot more than yeah, just yeah, yeah. bolting cars together. What was that like? Is is there an, an element of that stuff that you particularly you like? This this particular thing is like this is what gets me super excited about. I think all of it developing. was good. It was just developing that package to be faster. Yeah. Um. From me, I just wanted to win stuff. I think the competitive thing from my racing, st I still do now, but always got nervous when the cars were on the grid. But it was the only time because I sort of in my mind was putting myself. Like I wanted to be sitting there doing it, yeah. couldn't. So it was about making it right for them because they've got the opportunity. So make the car right. And that whole piece of it just getting faster and faster and competing against other like massively top teams, Fortec, Carlin, I mean, Rodin Carlin at the moment, obviously doing a great job yeah. and have done for a very long time. High tech now, obviously fighting in the same, same realm and uh, being in that considered globally in sort of one of those top five or six teams with Prima and other people like that was, was really cool. Yeah, it must be really cool tweaking bits working on it putting it on the car and if the car is faster that must be immensely satisfying i presume there are times when it's not which is <laughs> yeah or in the wall one of the two or in the wall um, yeah but yeah no it's some um, i think the the team piece like we were all in a position where we knew the driver could say something on the radio and we would already know what the change was going to be beforehand because we knew how our engineer worked we knew how we worked um there was never really any stress as such yeah. it was like okay cool he's he's moaned about oversteer whatever or understeer okay cool we'll, we already knew it'd be a roll by change we knew where we were with the car um yeah it was a bit disappointing when you'd spent i don't know three or four days with an all-nighter the night before and then turn up at a racetrack and ends up in the fence and wipes all the new bits off and they were the only set of new bits you had um but it, it happens i'd rather they were pushing and quick and shunt than toddling around at the back yeah, because I, I always see the sort of stories of, let's say, F1, where someone's been the car and you know at the factory that's it, right? They're firing up the machines and, and trying to produce a whole car in like a week. Um, was it a similar sort of, I guess, supply of parts and different, is, is a bit different, at, let's say, F3. But is it a similar sort of bubble? Are you, are you as a team making a lot of the parts or? I mean, we were then. Yeah. Um, now but with all the one make stuff and Delara it provided a great base car regardless yeah um, it's just that it got a little bit out of hand with people spending the money um, yeah. so yeah we produced probably 30-40% of that car and then the rest of it the big bits gearbox engine was supplied uh, all the big Delara pieces chassis crash structures all that sort of stuff were all supplied by them um, but then the bodywork after that was kind of free reign so we had quite a lot that was our own 
And then could you turn that stuff around reasonably quickly if needed or? We carried, again, we were, we were funded, so we carried a lot yeah, of spares. Yeah. Um, we had two complete spare cars built, okay. um, spare gearboxes, spare engines. Like we were spoiled in that respect. There were a lot of extra work when we were back in the factory because you've still got to prep them all and build them all. And, yeah. But um, they made life easy at the racetrack when it, when it wasn't so straight. Yeah, I can imagine that's, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, so you were then working there. Where did you move on? Um, again, I never really had an undying desire to sort of, I was just enjoying what I was doing. And then I happened to just glance, um, it was probably an autosport or something like that. Um, and there was an ad for, for Mercedes. Um, and I thought, ah, well, we'll see, you know, we won a championship. We're kind of, I kind of reached where I'd got to with that car. There was going to be another F, new F3 car coming. Mm. I was like, do I want to go through another phase with that? The rules were getting more restrictive. I thought, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, and got an interview straight away, which I was quite surprised about. Um, and then that all whittled down to being two of us that were sort of head to head. And actually, as it turned out, was a guy that I knew from another F3 team. Oh, really? Um, and neither of us knew that it was us two sort of head to head. And he got the nod on the fact that he had, he'd been doing it maybe six months longer than I had. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, they, you know, a couple of little notes, go and do a bigger series. So I went to do World Series, um, moved down to Norfolk, and I'd been there two weeks, and I got a phone call from the chief mechanic at Merck, and they were away testing, and they'd had an issue with someone, um, and were like, actually, we're going to shift around what we're doing. Uh, do you want a job? So I was like, uh, nice. yeah. So a week later, I left Norfolk again and came back up, back up this way. And is that, like, presume, is, is, is that the sort of peak? Not necessarily specifically a certain team, but... I guess everyone wants to work in F1 at some point. Yeah, I think it's just to understand how it works. You, yeah. When you were younger, you hear lots of, oh, you go to F1 and you turn one bolt and that's all you do and you get paid <laughs> You get paid to not really do anything and blah, blah, blah. And so I think it was just that curiosity of what is it actually like and what are the cars like? Because there's nothing else like them yeah. at all. So what, so, and what were you doing? What was your role? Uh, so I was what's uh, sort of affectionately known as an engine kitter, but um, engine install, um, and at the time looked after radiators and brakes as well. Um, so made it go, made it stop. And then are you, in, uh, and exactly, are you sort of, are you building the engine or are you just making sure it's in the car correctly? Yeah, so engines, come, engines come from Bricksworth um, and th we have guys on site that look after the whole running side of those. And obviously there's a, there's a whole load of stuff to do with data and performance and they look after all that. My role was to make sure with the other guys on the car that um, you know, you have a front end guy, a rear end guy, a gearbox guy, a floating mechanic, number one mechanic. Um, and my role was to make sure the engine was in when it should be, didn't leak, didn't do anything silly, radiators were all in and sorted and all in that right order so that the car went together, all, all good. Is it, presumably, when you, well, I, I don't know too much about necessarily engines, but I know I've seen some F1 engines and they just look different to normal engines. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I, the level, the stuff you're engineering wise, and what's the, what are some of the biggest things that are different about like an F, some F1 components versus just other stuff? Um, I think like my initial thing when I walked straight in, I, I started on a Tuesday and went straight to Barcelona on a Wednesday to a test. Nice. Um, so I rolled up to the garage and walked in, obviously the car's sitting there, um, and you're a little bit like, Oh, okay. This is all a bit, bit real all of a sudden. I think the biggest thing for me is just the detail. Every little component is thought about to within an inch of its life. Um, and they've all been through testing and everything to make sure it's as light and as strong and as durable as possible, or it needs to be for the rules. Um, if it's too, if it lasts too long, make it lighter. If it yeah. doesn't last long enough, we probably have to put some weight in it and make it a bit heavier, but make it work. And I think that's it. Just every single detail is like massively thought about and there's no huge restriction on a lot of the things they can do well, it's getting tighter but right interesting and then and are they are they all like special fasteners and stuff like that um varies yeah i mean a lot of them will, will manufacture their own bolts and to make the fittings the right length the right size the right strength um yeah it's just ludicrous and then all of a sudden you realize half your tools don't fit anything anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 and presumably you're like well, if everything is built exactly, each bolt is exactly right for each hole, for example, or whatever, then how do you know that you've got exactly the right bolt and exactly the right hole? Yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the other things that takes a bit of getting used to is everything is lifed. So every bolt or a majority of the bolts will have their own life number on their own barcodes. 
Um, oh, okay. And they will only do a certain amount of kilometers before they go in the bin. Um, so your build sheet would tell you what life numbers are going in what position. And then the part numbers we used to split. Uh, so the part number might be the same on the right and the left because the bolt is the same, yeah. but the life numbers would be different. So odds would go one side, even to go the other. And so you could trace everything through the car like that, <laughs> which is mad. <laughs> that is mad. And then after each race, does the whole car get fully back to zero or not necessarily? Pretty much. We used to, even if it didn't get done uh, circuit side, um, engines always came out Sunday night. Um, gearbox, depending on mileage, would potentially just be a travel gearbox. Um, and you'd strip off as much as you could and then you'd be back in the workshop the day after and, and pull it all apart back to a chassis and it all goes back into the factory for crack testing and all those other bits and pieces. And does it get shipped like... Presumably, actually, just keeping the car in one piece is probably the easiest way of moving all the parts without them getting damaged. Yeah, so now it's a bit different now, and it was changing um, when I was sort of coming out of F1. The, they now travel pretty much just as chassis with front suspension on. Okay. Um, smaller boxes, weights, and all that kind of stuff because um, it's all done on volume for air freight. Yeah. Um, but we used to travel, um, the cars used to be in like a rolling position but they never had an engine in as i say the gearbox tended to be a travel gearbox just something just to make it roll it fits yeah yeah and we we try and build as much of the front end as possible um but again within the time constraint between the races was always a bit tight yeah we, we were just having a little look around here and um like you've got quite a few f1 cars on site that's pretty cool yeah yeah, yeah does that feel good. does that still feel novel walking in and being like hang on a minute um it, it has its moments. Um, I think this, it's the, you get used to being in here all the time and having done it as a career forever, yeah, you yeah, sort yeah. of become a little bit blase to like, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, you get to show people around or other people come in and, and every now and again, you sort of sit and look at it on a, like when the sun's out on a Friday night when you go home, you've had a really good week and you're like, yeah, this is kind of cool. It's not bad. Yeah, it's yeah. not bad. So um, at what point did you move to TDF? So... Uh, I was traveling with Merck and then, um, uh, yeah, so I got, I got poorly, um, when we were traveling, um, which sort of came out of nowhere and I thought, oh, yeah. it's just going to be an illness, whatever. Um, and I got flown home from that race weekend and then struggled for, I missed one, one race, um, which really annoyed me. Um, and then I was, I really wanted to be back for the last race of the year. Um, so I probably rushed coming back a bit quickly yeah. um, because it was Brazil last race, done the whole year with Nico. It was like, just want to be there to, do, yeah, to yeah, see yeah, it yeah. out. Um, I had a, a good week. I was really struggling with my health. Um, Nico's trainer and Michael's trainer, actually. Um, Kai and Daniel were like mega all week, just feeding me with stuff. It was, nice. like, it was great. Um, but on the like once we got through Friday, which is always the hard day, um, Nico was like, oh, we've done the hard bit for the year now. And I was like, yeah, I want to stay. And it, but he actually paid to fly me home. Um, so I flew back on the Saturday and watched the Grand Prix from home on the Sunday, which was odd. Was um, odd. <laughs> and, th and then I, I proceeded to have about three months where I was completely written off. Um, oh, really? Oh. And so then the following year, I had to make more decisions about um, when I could travel, the doctors wouldn't let me travel. Um, and uh, it also stemmed from... Um, what I think was maybe glandular fever. Right. Um, but it turned into ME, which is like chronic fatigue. Yeah. Um, so I really, really struggled. And obviously with the how intense the, the years are with 20 plus races and does that I sort of was caught between a rock and a hard place. I could go and do a race weekend, but then it'd write me off and for two wrecked. weeks. And then I you can't because there's another race. Um so I did a few races that year. Um and my last race actually would have been uh Barcelona, which was the Williams Garage Fire weekend actually. All right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, that was the last one. Um, and then I was there until later in the year. Um, and then I had to make a decision what I was going to do. So I uh, chose to leave. I had a little bit of time to sort my health out. Um, and then I was just always looking to get back to most. But we didn't really know how or I was kind of a bit lost for a while, I guess. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I did some other bits and pieces in between and was trying to work out the best way back. Um, and I went and worked for a company that do the driver seats. Yeah, I thought well, this, this is a good way back. They're, it's basically one company, one guy called Real, um, and Vaughan sort of took the punt on, like he's ex F one as well, and he sort of took the punt on, like look, let's go and let's go and do this. So he looked after me, um, went and made seats, which was the most fascinating thing. Um, 
and then yeah, TDF sort of came about as an option 2016 time. Mm. Um, and it was a very, very different business. Didn't really do what it was doing now, but the business started originally as a sort of road car tuning facility. Okay. Not that you'd necessarily believe yeah, it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the guy that was here, he was quite good with electronics and through meeting people and that whole kind of networking thing and sort of stumbled into um, somebody had asked him, can you help with this? Could you look after it? And it just, he just said yes. Yeah. Um, and then he, I think he realized he'd sort of got to a point that he's like, I don't really understand these cars anymore. <laughs> um, so myself and Dean, who's here as head of car build, were sort of XF1, but still keen. Um, and he sort of pulled us. Well, we got pulled in. Dean, actually, I've known since we were, I don't know, saying earlier, maybe 17 or 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was doing the same sort of thing with other teams. Um, and then, yeah, so we came here and got involved with with things here, but it was very different then. Um, but we were just here to provide some sort of support to, you know, help them understand the cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that. Before we move on to TDF, I just I'm just interested when you're working as a mechanic for an F1 team. It it looks like absolutely insane just on schedule. Like, yeah. Is it really difficult to sort of maintain some sort of life outside F1 whilst being in F1 because you're just you're literally on the road the whole time, aren't you, basically? Uh, yeah, it's tough. Um, I think I was in a good position. I was like, there were two of us actually, like I was saying about it, and um, pretty much the youngest in the pit lane um, at that point, like uh, very early 20s, mm. um, of which that's more common now. Um, and yeah, single... It wasn't so much of an issue for me, but I think the guys that were have families, um, one of the guys I was with, um, he, until he stopped traveling, he hadn't actually been around for, he's got two kids. Yeah. Either of them when they were born, none of their birthdays. And one of them was like, I think the first birthday he was around for was like their ninth birthday. Ouch. So you have to sacrifice a lot. Um, yeah. and, it, and you do bounce weekend to weekend and you're obviously there from a Monday or Tuesday before the race pack up after the Grand Prix finishes and the TVs turn off is seven or eight hours. It's, they are very intense weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, because back then it was, you were saying it's 20 weekends. What is it now? It's, it's quite a lot more, isn't it? 20, it should be 23 or 24, but a couple of them have been knocked back with COVID stuff still going on. Um, but I think they're aiming, I mean, they, they've spoken about 30, which is crazy. Um, but I think they're right on the limit of struggling with having to make second teams or more more staff and i think they're yeah they're right on the limit yeah and what sort of amount of because i know we've had a little bit of the engines in theory have changed because of environmental reasons or just pushing the technology etc cetera, etc cetera. but you look at the amount of like freight and, and stuff going around what sort of what turns up on and which day does it turn up to then create all of the what's going on by the time of the weekend? Uh, it depends. Uh, we, I mean, we used to fly with about 60 tons, okay. um, which is ludicrous when the cars only weigh uh, 700 kilos <laughs> or whatever they were, 650 <laughs> kilos. Um, but yeah, that would all turn up. If we were doing a flyaway, that would all arrive on maybe the Sunday before, um, if it was the first race weekend. And then garage build guys would be in Monday, Tuesday. We'd arrive Tuesday be in the garage Wednesday working on the car, Wednesday, Thursday on the car, and then obviously on circuit Friday, um, pack down Sunday night, and then everything would be boxed, ready to go seven, eight hours after the checker flag went. Um, and then from there, if we were going like Japan, Korea, straight to the next one, uh, it would leave the circuit that night. Uh, we would fly first thing Monday morning and meet it in Korea. It'd already be there. And oh, then we'd right. just go straight back in and do it all again. Jeez. <laughs> and then with the trucks, same sort of thing. Um, you get everything loaded, those big motorhomes come down, the buildings on the back come down. Um, and then, yeah, if we, like Barcelona, Monaco always used to be back to back. Um, we would drive down on the Monday from Barcelona and you'd be overtaking the trucks because obviously the motorhomes need to be in there first thing yeah. and get them back up again by Tuesday so that we can run again on Wednesday. So it's just relentless. But they, they have got a few more teams and a few more bits and pieces going on now to try and help that. And I think they've tried to cut some of the freight back and but it's still... It's when you look at when you look at the setups and it, how sort of solid and legit everything looks, and you're like, this literally just gets packed down and disappears somewhere else, and then gets appeared again. It's, it is is quite amazing. The, the logistic side of all of that in itself is pretty insane. Yeah, I think um, I did see somewhere that it's apart from the Olympics, it's the biggest sporting event um, 
total in terms of what it moves and it happens once a week or once every two weeks through the yeah. summer whereas the olympics is once every four years it's yeah, yeah, yeah yeah insane <laughs> it's pretty mad it's pretty mad so when you started working here what what was tdf doing at that point in time um a little bit of everything there was sort of um gt cars in here some touring cars um a couple of f1 little bits and pieces um but it didn't it was didn't necessarily have a driven direction on where it was going um, I think it was one of those young businesses. The guy that was here before was trying to, I didn't really know where he wanted to take it. Um, and then we started working on what then turned into the TDF one, which was an idea based around an easy to run F1 car, which was yeah. something that, that, that we'd spoken about uh, internally for a while. Um, and something that Dean and I were keen to explore. Having done junior single seaters, we were like, yeah. can we sort of combine the two? Um, all the amazing bits of F1 and all the like easy bits of junior single seaters. Um, and so we started to work that project together. Um, and then uh, there was a little bit of investment came in. Um, and when that came in, I think the business then had to step up. And that's when there was a sort of a decision to make about what was going to happen with the business going forward. And that's yeah. when um, I think the direction that I was pushing for um, was was the right direction and also uh the guy that started the business before was sort of dabbling in other things um and so i think it's just the right time i think he decided i'm kind of out of my depth here and I, i'm going to go and do something different which he has gone on to do um and then yeah i was kind of asked to sort of step into the breach a little bit and go right okay now what do we do with this so so you're like right let's make an f1 car easier to run so that people can run them on whatever private track days or clubs or, or something or other what is uh, that process like making an f1 car easier to run I mean, we just talked about yeah. the logistics of running an f1 car so that we're saying it's pretty it's pretty extreme with the number of people and etc cetera, etc cetera. so what's the process how do you make that simpler uh the the big things in f1 that that make it difficult and you need the people apart from the fact that the, the like you say the travel logistics and the fact that they are very structured in the way a race weekend works you need yeah. to, be able to do things quickly react very quickly to changes um powertrain wise engines gearbox especially the v6 hybrid stuff they are amazing bits of kit but they are a complete headache in terms of people especially with the electrical energy with the rs systems and all that kind of stuff um so we just took it back and went right can we get a sensible amount of horsepower um which actually turned out to be like we were able to hit the horsepower figures that we wanted to. Um, but yeah, can we do it? Can we make it easier to run? Can we delete some of the things that need crack testing every time the car runs, like carbon steering columns right. and that kind of stuff, but maintain the safety um, and maintain as much of the aerodynamic of the car as possible because the teams have spent a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and the moment you start changing those, you kind of take that all away. Um, so they were kind of the briefs really. It was like, can we get something in the back of one of these that will give an authentic F1 experience, but without all the headache for a, for a private owner. Yeah. So, and so what is that? What's the engine? So we settled on a four cylinder turbo, um, to look at is loosely based around sort of a Volkswagen group four cylinder. Yeah. Um, but, uh, then we've, we work with Mount Tuner, a partner of ours, uh, turn the power up. So it's running anywhere between 450 and 600 horsepower, okay. which is tunable. Um, and then it's a, a derived Hewlett and gearbox um, with our own rear suspension in the back. Um, and then, uh, yeah, aerodynamically, it fits in under the car. Uh, we don't have to change bulkheads. All the safety stuff remains as was. FIA crash structures all around. Um, and we can get the rear wing back where it should be. And you can run it with one person. And what was the, what was the car? What's the chassis that you put the engine in? So we did it. The first one we did was a 2011 Sauber. I mean, that was kind of like a mule car. We just yeah. hoiked it together to see, or hoiked it together, it's a loose term. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, but <laughs> yeah, we sort of pieced it together to see if it would work. It did. Um, we were like, right, okay, cool. And then we went out and hunted some chassis. So the, the first batch of five were uh, three Marushas and then two Sauvers, which one of them is sitting here at the moment. Yeah. Um, but the idea behind it was like, right, okay, cool. This now works. People are starting to head towards track day cars. Um, and I think now you see the emergence with like Valkyrie Pros and that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, and the Ferrari programs, 
that's definitely the way it was going to go. And we were just sort of like, let's head to the vets and, and go for it. They can paint them whatever color. All our clients can paint them, spec them. They can turn up with everything from a race truck to team wear to as many personnel as they want and boarding and the whole kit and caboodle or literally just the car. Yeah. Um, and it's completely tailorable to how people envisage their world of Formula One. Interesting. Okay. And, and we were just having a little look around um, before and I, I didn't really... I'd never thought about this. Why would I thought about this? Because I've never looked at anything like this. But when the the engine is a stress member, right? Yeah. So you've put a different engine in. Yep. Does that change a lot of things? Because presumably the new engine is not exactly the same size as the old engine, and therefore all the mounting points, all the everything's moved. Uh, yeah, I, w I wish it was the same, and we could just <laughs> pop it in the back. Um, no, so our engine sits. Um, we have a. An adapter plate that sits between the chassis and the engine which means we never had to touch the hard points in the chassis um, which means should someone ever want to turn it back to original um, once they've driven it for a while if they come back to us and go actually do you know what i want to put the v8 back in this yeah we can just do it straight away um and then yeah the the whole engine packaging in the rear is uh, it actually sits in a in kind of a frame it's semi-stressed not fully stressed um and then it uses the gearbox as the second sort of stress member um, and that was sort of a compromise we had to take to keep the budgets under control and not having to develop mm. our own engine. Um, but as I say, it's 600 horsepower and the car is with me in it, about 700 kilos. It's um, probably pretty quick. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not slow. <laughs> yeah, it's not slow. Was that quite... It's almost yep. mowing a bit of grass. Um, was that... That must have been quite a moment the first time you got it running and on a track yeah i mean uh, for especially with the mule car it was like it was together and we knew it worked and it was like okay let's go and see what we can do and at the, at the time i was racing formula renault i'd had an opportunity to to race formula renault for a couple of years nice. um and we won the won the championship the first year um and in a, in the midst of all that we were coming up with this program um and so fortunately the the person who had sort of not gifted the chassis but the deal was you know we didn't have a huge amount of money so the deal was look we've got a car that we don't know what we're doing with it let's see if we can do something so they let me drive the car at Zolder at a demo which was the first proper on track running that we did um and uh yeah it was insane although you have to go through all those bits in your head of development and looking after this and seeing what problems we've got and fault finding and all that stuff yeah you can't just pin it and off you go <laughs> yeah it was um it was like okay and then afterwards like actually this is something we've put together this is something that we've built it loves the grass <laughs> um yeah something that we built from scratch um was a nice uh was like a really nice feeling and it worked pretty much straight out of the box um it was like okay we've got something here that we could be could be really cool yeah that that in itself because you, you know all the effort that's gone into designing the various bits and pieces. Um, I hear over, like, I just, you know, anecdotally hear that different cars are easier to drive than others. And generally, I mean, the ones at the very front are often the easiest. Is that, is that a... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think, especially once you start talking about aero stuff, you look at F1, you know, um, like currently the Williams guys are having to hang on a little bit. Yeah. Um, and the Red Bull Max is just cruising, cruising. around up front. Um, I think there's a there's a sort of fine line of misconception in there that uh, sometimes you can hop yeah some, and sometimes you're going to hop in a race car and go and lap and you're like this thing is like hooked up and you come back and look at the times and it's terrible yeah yeah, yeah. and then you go back out and you drive around ten laps with a change in the car and you're hanging on for dear life and you come back and it's half a second quicker and you're like it doesn't make sense but I'll drive the one that's hard work because it's faster yeah um, but yeah there yeah there is a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, so looking at the, the base cars that people put engines in, is, the, is there a lot of thought that goes into which car? Because presumably some cars are going to be cheaper to buy than others. Some would be running at the front of the pack. Some would be running at the back of the pack back when they were, you know, running. Yeah. Um, Did many of them get changed at all, really, to make them possibly slightly better? Or are all the ones you're using actually the they're pretty they're pretty good yeah i think uh again you know whether it's like i just said there williams or red bull they're still they're all running around within a second of each other across yeah. a six kilometer racetrack it's ludicrous really um 
So whether you're at the back or not, there are still epic bits of kit. And for most people, you won't really get near the performance envelope. Yeah. So for us, as long as they've got all the bits on, um, we look for certain parts when we get the cars either directly, generally directly from the teams now, because um, we've got some really good relationships with a lot of the teams. Um, yeah, we as long as they've got the components on that we need as the big basis to start from, we tend to try and leave them alone. Um, yeah. We do improve certain areas, but that's more to do with um, maybe improvement is the wrong word. We re-engineer certain areas um, to get rid of that you know, carbon steering columns and need crack testing every time the car runs. Yeah. It's just not feasible for a private client. Um, so we tend to go to our own metallic columns with crash structures and they all perform in the same way, but they don't need the same upkeep. And they're slightly heavier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, do the people that have bought the cars, do they ramp up to driving something like that? Uh, yeah, we do. We do uh, driver development package yeah. depending on on who they are and where they are with it, from nutrition and training and all that kind of stuff. Um, it varies. One of the guys at the moment is full blown in the gym working out shifting a bit of weight nice he's like i'm gonna make the most of this um a couple of the others are a bit more like it's another toy so yeah i'll, I'll fit it's fine <laughs> um yeah, fair enough but they but then at the same time once they get out in the car and they're they're like oh, okay and then they start to get the the old clock cogs, yeah, cogs yeah, working yeah. a little bit um so yeah we'll see i think as time goes on i think we'll probably see them start especially once we can get on events where they're all together I yeah, think it starts to get yeah, competitive. Yeah. I think then it will be, uh, be a different story then. Yeah, because it's all very well if you're in a... I mean, ultimately, you're having a great... You're having an absolutely great time regardless. But if you're on a test day, and we were saying you can take one of these on a single-seater session on a normal test day and run it around with <laughs> everyone else, which seems, seems slightly unfair on everyone else. But if you're lapping 15 seconds a lap faster than everyone else without really trying, you still feel like a hero. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whereas if someone's in the same car and they're lapping to 10, 10 seconds a lap faster than you, you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've missed the boat. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think, um, I think generally uh, people's necks tend to fall off before. That's, before that's, they... What sort of G-forces? Um, so, I mean, when we've been testing, can pull four, four and a half G on the brakes. <sighs> same, same with the cornering generally. Um, although we run a, we have a partnership with Pirelli. Um, so we do run on Pirelli tires, but they aren't a, like a current spec tire. So you do lose a tiny bit of peak performance. So I would tend to say to people three, three and a half G cornering, if not a bit more, if they can start to get on it, uh, four, four and a half G on the brakes. I can't, I can't get my head around that. I've, I've driven with some reasonable downforce and probably done two and a half. Mm -hmm. And that, a, a day at two and a half, five sessions or something i'm like completely walking down the street like <laughs> just with one ear on my shoulder like okay i can't imagine like double that is i think imagine i had to probably do about four laps and that's it game over yeah it's mad i think um I, there's again there's a stat kicking around somewhere about you know like a chiron or something on like max break is like one and a half g yeah, or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. um it just it's just crazy but again when you're strapped in nice and tight focused uh, it's what you're there to do. It's it's a little bit different, but yeah, the guys do tend to get out and they're like, oh yeah, no, yeah, I'm great, I'm fine, yeah, don't worry about it. And you see them about half an hour later, and it's like, are you uh, you laying down? Like, no, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> do they have um, head supports? So the headrests are in the car. Some of the drivers will run with like padding on the headrests just yeah. to, just to help, especially when they're sort of starting out because they've never driven anything like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, they're quite confined in there anyway. Um, there's not really that not far. Not rattling around yeah. too much as you. Just <laughs> yeah. trying to, I am 100% do that. I just rest my head yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. Like, well, might as well give it a bit just of a break. a little snooze while I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't imagine driving something like that. And, and so the, having a Turbo 4, why, why did you go down that route? Why not, uh, you know, V10 or something? Uh, packaging as much as anything else. Um, okay. We did, didn't want to touch any of the body work they you know we have retrofitted v10s into uh what we call, called like tdf works which is kind of our heritage side of the business um where we'll put a brand new judd v10 in space of where there would have mm. been a v10 previously because the sizing is about right but they just don't fit um, oh, okay and you, you know it would be cool to see a 
It'd be interesting to see actually what people are saying, but I think that it would be cool to see a modern era car with all the noise, because that's the thing that everybody really misses. would. Um, and that's something we've toyed with. Um, but again, packaging is, is difficult because um, they're obviously so shrink wrapped to fit around. Yeah, they're such eight or six. bespoke engines for their, for their usage. So what, and the, what does yours rev up to? Uh, when we're turned up eight and a half. Okay. So they're fairly noisy um, and they spit big flames and do all the things you kind of nice. want an, an angry race car <laughs> to do. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things I think the first time you drive a car with like a proper sequential, mm -hmm. like an actuated thing that's like doing that, you're, like, you're instantly, you're like, this is not a road car anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. Like you get used to the revs. Yeah, and straight line performance, right? Like fast, fast in a straight line. There's some of the hypercars, we were talking about hypercars earlier, the yeah. way they deliver performance now is insane. Um, from anything from a 720S up, it's just license losing stuff at all times. Um, so straight line performance is great. It's just the fact that when you arrive there in these, you can just stay on it. Yeah, that uh, psychologically, I think the first time I, so I, I have a Radical, an SR3. Yeah. And um, the first time I went out with like a coach driving and I'm in the passenger seat and you're wherever on a track, and you're like, I've driven past the 200 meter board, I've driven past <laughs> 150. Ah, oh, we're still kind of getting to the hundred, and it's not slowed down yet. And you want to throw up, and you're like, uh, and then like, yeah. <laughs> tap the brakes a little bit around the corner. You go, and you're like, Whoa. this is obviously another. This is a whole another level above that. Um, that did you find driving up the, the various cars that that was a, an interesting thing to try and get your head around? Uh, I think having been around aero, I kind of had the principle in my head as ever. Oh, it's yeah. easy. Just break it 80 meters. Actually doing it is a bit different. Um, having hopped out of the Formula Renault, in terms of the way you drive, it's, you know, 90 meters, get on the brakes. It's just that you arrive, instead of arriving at 110 miles an hour, you arrive at 150 or 60. Yeah. Um, but the first time you arrive and you're like, I'm going to break early. I'm just going to, gonna, you know, it's carbon. So it's slightly different with the brakes to, to steels. Um, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm just going to, go on the brakes a bit early, say 150 and see where we are. And you're like, oh, I've stopped. Yeah. No, I just drive up to the corner. <laughs> you're like, all oh, right, okay, no, I can crack on. So I think if you, if you know the principle, it's not too bad. Like with the radical, it's the same, same principle, but yeah, sometimes when you're driving at something that's pretty much a dead end is, uh, uh, yeah, it takes a few laps to just get your head to. But yeah, you do, you know, uh, straight away, you know, straight away, as soon as you've hit the brakes or the accelerator or whatever, you know, your brain does the calculation and goes, Oh, no problem. Yeah. You've got many more beaters. You're like, yeah, but I was going quite fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but like you say, you edge up on it, you take, you know, you take the big chunks, 20 meters, 30 meters straight yeah, yeah, away. Yeah, and yeah. then once you're into that hundred meter window where you know you're getting close, you then just knock a meter at a time out of it. Yeah. And how, so you say carbon, I'm not, I don't think I've driven anything with those sorts of carbon brakes. Carbon carbon, is that what they're called? Yeah, so we have our own disc that is sort of, sit somewhere between a carbon carbon and I guess the easiest way to explain it would be like a carbon ceramic. Um, so what that does for us is just lower the operating temperature slightly, oh, okay. give it a slightly wider window to work in. Um, but you do lose the like super peak performance, but again, you still, still hit four and a half, yeah. four and a half G. So they do still work, but what it does is for a, a driver that's not driven them before or someone that um, is less confident, you don't need the the big impact hits, um, you know, at 450 degrees, they will start to come on reasonably well. Um, and then they work all the way up to sort of eight, 900 degrees. Whereas the, the full carbon carbons, which we drove on the very first car were epic, but they took quite a bit of management. Um, and that, you know, they need to sit in that sort of six to 800 degrees window all the time. <laughs> so that first, the first lap, what are you doing? Are you, left foot braking and driving for a bit and then you can't get the away with it. it they don't like it um because they're carbon they they can also suffer with a thing uh where they're too cold and they start to get all mountainous and they glaze and they go horrible so you from the moment you go out you've just got to be on them and just accept that the first time you break they're not really going to work um but your your hit needs to be good you know 80 100 bar just get into them as long as the tires <laughs> will take it yeah um get into them and start start using them because once the temp's up they're fine um, and yeah, you run tire warmers? We don't have to. Um, something that Pirelli is great with with, the, with this compound is you can go out and run. So you, again, so you don't need 10 people around the car. Um, we, we do run both 
depending on what we're doing, if it's a demo, we don't need to worry about it. We have run obviously testing with blankets because it just takes those first couple of laps of warm up away. First corner. <laughs> yeah, first corner. Yeah, just nothing going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, but I mean, most of the places we run with out in thermal, it's 35 degrees by the time you've got a lap yeah. in, provided you don't go mad and, and cold grain the top of them, they're fine. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's a, I'm quite keen to drive something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't, I, I, that's it. I just can't get my head at all around the performance, like the, what that will, would, would be like. Yeah. Um, and you say, as you, say, you can't get it anywhere else. There's, not, there's nothing else you can drive that gets close to that. No. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's the thing for us, you know, these, the OEM manufacturers do unbelievable stuff like the Valkyrie Pro. Like we were at a demo with that and we ran together with that um, in Laguna Seca last year. It's stunning. Um, and it was built obviously primarily as a race car, which you can see when you can poke your head around yeah. a bit. Um, it's epic. And you know, the Ferrari track derived stuff, people buying GT3 race cars, or GT4, GT3 race cars, GT3 stuff now is serious kit. Um, but F1 is F1 without going in and buying, you know, any single seater level, whether it's Formula Renault or F3, F2, it is the pinnacle. Um, and I think that's the point. And, and that's the other bit that ties it in. They come with the history and, you know, they've got a race history. You can tell your friends about the drivers that have driven them and you can go and watch it on TV racing against Lewis or whatever. Um, yeah, that is really cool. And yeah, the fact that you can put this, your sort of kit, I don't know how you quite describe it, but your package into an existing car with history and yeah, you're not using the engine, but you know. Yeah, I mean. You're not having the cost. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, ultimately, the, the newer we're getting with the cars, the more complicated they are, the less support anybody's gonna have in the future for running. Yeah. I mean, the hybrid era stuff, unless you're a team, um, I mean, it's just not really gonna be a thing. Yeah, cause you're, and what years will you put stuff into, up to? So this current package, we sort of work in a window between uh, 09 and, 14 it will fit in some of the earlier v6 stuff but we've tried to what we'd like to do is this sort of generation one i guess we call it yeah. um we want to keep it in that window 10 cars um and then we'll develop from there we've got i've shown you around the workshop earlier we've got a 19 car um which i think is probably well and there's one other 19 car in uh private hands that's in america so it's, how do you get hold of a, an F1 car that's like remotely new? Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> friends in good places and, and, and knowing where they are. You Presumably know. you're not going to get hold of Max's car. <laughs> from a, well, I mean, from a network, uh, I mean, uh, it would be a great thing to get hold of, wouldn't it? I'm assuming Mercedes would pay a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I think everyone, I think they should just group together and buy one. Yeah. Um, but no, I think, um, yeah, we, we've got a great network. Um, obviously, everyone sort of here, Dean had a car build myself, uh, Simon, who's our head of design and manufacture, all XF1. Yeah. So we've got good network and people we've known through the years. Um, and we've got working relationships with, uh, we've got a big auction house that we work with. Um, and we sort of looked at it differently from a business standpoint as we've got relationships in and partners in, uh, in America over at Thermal and with Ogara. Yeah. Um, and then in Australia, we have Sagami and uh, we're working with a circuit down there. And then there's Asia and the Middle East are coming and we're trying to, create is this sort of global pattern for being able to have the cars looked after, have access, have access to everybody's network and everybody kind of have a hub that they can run through, which would be us. Yeah. 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 Cause it'd be great if you've got, if you, let's say you live in the UK but, and you're like, well, I can bring it to you guys here. But actually if I want to ship my car to the U S ideally, I don't want to send all of my people over to the U S to run the car. If there's some people there that are switched on and we use them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're, they're based out at Thermal, um, which is in the middle of the desert. It's like an insane facility. Um, I don't know whether you've seen it. I've, I've heard of it, but I've not been. It's, it's, the, it's the Portuguese golf course with the houses all the way around, but as a racetrack in the desert, <laughs> it's insane. Um, and they're, they're growing like just, the, the kit there is ridiculous. I um, mean, you can literally drive out the garage, drive around, drive it back in the garage, which you can do with these. Which, which is, like that, I think anyone that's, you, you go start doing track days or whatever, you, you normally take your road car and then you start doing track days and then you're like, ah, oh, actually it would be a lot better if, whether it's you want a cage or you want to change brakes or whatever, drive something that you don't care about so much if it goes in the gravel. 
but that immediately then you have to put it on a trailer you have to might have to look after it a little bit whatever blah 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 blah. the idea of being able to drive anything like you said one of these out of your garage onto the track without having to go on a road and then worst case scenario if you bin it it can go back in the garage and then get looked after you don't have to take it back somewhere yeah you can leave it in the wall and go and have a barbecue <laughs> on your balcony and watch yeah. everybody else go around it <laughs> yeah that sounds absolutely mental yeah insane it is insane and the the architecture there as well because all the guys are you know ultra high net worth guys um and they are able to build the houses that they want um and they've all got a especially the guys that we deal with they've got this attention to detail thing that I think is what helps drive them towards it as a sport yeah. anyway and the the team aspect um so yeah the the properties that are going out there are crazy yeah I can imagine it's it's pretty interesting so running running one of these cars around Silverton or something like that what what is a what could the car do as like a lap time see that's, that's like an f1 driver yeah I mean that's something we've tried to not disassociate ourselves with but for our clients it's about them going out and having fun and pushing themselves okay so the you don't cars. want to actually tell them how slow they are yeah yeah the, that too <laughs> um but yeah you know uh, i think you know we've tried to get it somewhere in the ballpark obviously there are, it, we've got a slight weight thing slightly down on power by about sort of 50 60 horsepower from period um and tires are different and all those sort of we run the cars slightly higher than they would have been just as protection for the floor and likewise protection for drivers that haven't been used to cars yeah. slamming the floor everywhere where the front wheels aren't on the ground anymore <laughs> um all that kind of stuff so that you know we aren't going to be on the pace of them i've got no doubt that we could get you know to within a, a decent percentage if we went out and we went testing we we dropped we them went back for it yeah. But yeah um but yeah we we tried to we made quite a conscious decision early doors not to go chasing the you know Donington lap record or Silverstone for you know anything that's not an actual F1 car and chasing that stuff for an intimidation point of it, it they are quite a scary thing I think when you yeah. first hop in one um and what we're trying to do is make it approachable for yeah for people um whether we do a development program we've obviously got the simulator um whether we do that as a simulator we can do on track work here and then we can we can go to them and do on track work and with that all our other partners um it's about it being approachable and enjoyable um yeah the, the works cars that we work on they are epic um you know v10 v8 i mean we've done stuff all the way from the 50s all the way through um but when you've got a schumacher 94 car um that was a championship winning car that you petrified about breaking it crashing yeah. it doing something silly with it so when you go to the circuit and when you do run it for a demo or a senna car um you like i just petrified about yeah. doing something stupid and taking the history away um so our the, the plan with these really is that people can go out and run them around if they shunt them we can re remanufacture everything yeah. um and then if like some of them have got in their collection original cars they can then pound around in these all day and then have a really enjoyable few laps in yeah. the original car at some point during the day which is like that's that's the fun bit then it makes it more exciting and, and interesting for them yeah and it's good to have be able to as you say like get laps in in something that's it's similar mm -hmm. sort of vibe you can't just go around in your whatever latest ferrari and then jump back into a, an f1 car like it's yeah or, or it's even better the, the, the world's fastest hire car from the airport that you've come in from <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah 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 full send yeah exactly um well and i know that like from from my experience of, of some racing like minimal but some generally the slower the cars the easier i've found it to get to probably what would be the fastest put a pro in it whatever it's that pole time type thing but as more aero and etc it actually get, it gets harder and you get further away yeah like a good amateur is that is then further away with this sort of level of car what what could that be 10 seconds easy easy i think the thing is that uh with the with the power you know if you're on the throttle i mean you see it in current f1 if the guy in front is on throttle half a tenth before you are it's 30 meters up the road before you even know which way it went yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the same thing you know if you if you are at silverstone and you are two seconds later on the throttle at Luffield or whatever <laughs> you know compared to the pro that was on the throttle earlier it's gone yeah um so it, it, it is quite easy to lapse 
what seems like huge chunks of time, but actually very small changes will then bring that back. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting one. I, I sort of think about my own enjoyment of driving on track. And uh, almost as time goes on, I look at setting like an ultimate, ultimate lap time as like this, this weird academic exercise. Yeah, Because like you can be really, if you're really, really fast, you're also really specific on that specific track like it's you've learned that track and yeah. you've learned a very spe- set of skills that don't necessarily translate <laughs> into anything other than lapping but it's, it's a very cool it's a very cool thing to do but at the same time i do sometimes dial back and be like yeah but if i'm a second on that faster does it is my life going to change <laughs> no. yeah yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the point right it's th- these projects are meant to be interesting for people if people want to go racing we can support them going racing um in whether that be in GT3 or, or other categories, we've got guys that do Ferrari Challenge and all sorts. Um, yeah. They can get that bug elsewhere. Like you say, this is this that like personal challenge of either being fit enough or being able to get out and go, actually, that was insane. Nobody else has done that. And I yeah. think the single seaters are great for that because you can't share that experience. That was always my drive when I was yeah. a kid to go single seat. It's like karting. Once you're in it, it's you. Um, and when you're sitting on the grid, former Renault, whatever it might be, and things slapping against the limiter. There's like you and 30 other guys. And it's, you know, it is what it is now. It's yeah. up to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, and yeah. I, I've got the biggest appreciation for rally. I don't think I could listen to someone else talking to me while I was doing it and not end up in the trees. And but, not necessarily know where you're going apart from what they've just said. Yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'd be in the hedge straight away. <laughs> <laughs> looking, around, uh, looking around the carts, I, I always hear about packaging, packaging. I read it, like Adrian Newey's book and he's always talking about packaging and, yeah. and, or someone's come up with a different way of doing it and therefore it's changed da, 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 and therefore the packaging can change. And, yeah. But when you look like looking at these cars without the bodywork on or missing some bodywork, it's, in, it's insane. Like there's just tiny little wires and bits of hydraulic this moving and that and blah, blah, switches and et cetera, all just crammed into the smallest spaces possible does that i mean presumably that makes working on them does that make working on them hard if, if they've already been done or uh yeah yeah i mean when you're doing it week in week out proper f1 stuff um you know in some ways it's easier because it's all designed goes together yeah some of these cars have been played with before they get here and that can lead you down the garden path a little bit um they're not too bad if they're all there um it's more complicated when there are like a load of lines come into one place and just something missing. You know, like, <laughs> well, no, I, need, I know what it needs to do. I just need to imagine how it goes back in, which is what the guys in the workshop are doing. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it is difficult. Putting the TDF1 program into these chassis has been difficult in terms of packaging um, just to get all the systems back in because it's not designed around our systems. It was designed around their own systems. Um, but yeah, that's kind of part of the fun of it. Yeah, and then if someone buys, so someone buys a, what's the process if someone wants to have a car built done? Do they just go? Do they go? Oh, I've already bought this car. Can you put an engine in it and sort it out? Or are you like, no, don't buy that one. Yeah, yeah there's a few <laughs> like that. Um, no, the, so the TDF one program are chassis that we will hold as stock, um, and we take any buyer, potential buyer, through that whole process from, um, you know. Our sales process is really open. The workshop is open. Come and see us. Um, we go through everything. Uh, go through uh, same as like road cars, really the big deposit phase. Um, and then when you go through everything from there, we do all the renders and we can break the car right down into tiny components that can be any color or mm. whatever they like or not. If they just go, I want it and it's blue. Let's go. You can do that. Um, people with their own cars, we would tend to put into TDF works. Um, and then we can look at all sorts of options there, um, whether that be going fully original with it, depending on budget, um, or running the car with new new spec uh, engines or gearboxes, that kind of route, or or some combination of all. Uh, the the 04 Honda that I was showing you around earlier, the, the client brief was, it wants to be made of, of, of F1 bits, but obviously Honda destroyed pretty much everything when they right. left the first time, uh, or second, third time, whatever it would have been. Um, so that's got a, a period correct V10 in it and a slightly newer gearbox on it that are all from different cars. So trying oh, wow. to get them together and work is uh, 
uh, yeah, it's been a headache, but it's gonna, but it will be an F1 car when it's back together. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I don't know how I like personally. I don't know. I guess it. Would, I guess it depends on the car and the situation and your association with it and whatever. Because your ability to manufacture stuff mm -hmm. and the ability of other people to manufacture stuff that has that has presumably changed so much over the last in just ten years, technology wise, of what you could make. That I guess. If you have the specs, you can make it exactly the same, but it's not the same. Obviously, it's not yeah, original, yeah. but then it's a race car. So I don't know how, the, that's well, the, how do most people feel about that. That's the difficult bit, right? Like the, that, that chassis is a, is a button car. They were the fastest cars ever until 2021 or mm. 2020, whichever year it was, 2020. Um, and it finished second to Schumacher in the championship. That chassis did all year apart from the first race because he damaged it in qualifying. Um, you know, it's finished on the podium in a lot of places, pole positions, second in the championship, was a mega year. But the components surrounding the chassis, as you say, the cars come apart, they break stuff, they put new bits on. They're a little bit like Trigger's broom, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is difficult, but that car would never be from a running position. You know, yes, you could put a Judd V10 in, um, you know, you could do a gearbox, whatever, but the costs become, if you wanted to put your own gearbox on that, the costs are huge. Um, so it's, I guess, a cost-effective, for want of a better way of putting it, yeah. way of getting that car back to being a running car. And a lot of it is these guys want them for their collections, but they also want to get out people to see the cars, go yeah. and do demonstrations, be at events like the Silverstone Classic or the British Grand Prix that we're at this year, um, and make some noise and people get to see them. Otherwise, they just end up in like company receptions or hanging on the wall somewhere, and that's a bit of a shame. Yeah, there's nothing like that. I've been at a few events when some older F1 cars have been running around. And you, you go, oh yeah, <laughs> I remember this. Yeah. I remember how epic sounding these things are versus versus the new stuff. Yeah, how, how do you feel about the current state of F one and and the cars? Uh, two sided from a like the engineering point of view, they are just unbelievable. I think especially the sort of twenty twenty with all the aero on. Yeah, just twenty 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 one inside of the nineteen car here just stunning bits of works of art and they are again works of art now um i think the racing it does, i mean max doesn't help because he just checks out every weekend <laughs> um but they've done a great job with the car um so yeah no i think it is in quite a good place generally i think the whole netflix effect has done a great thing for the sport in general it has done wonders max like i i it's something i've i've followed i've never i've not massively been into f1 and then um i've sort of followed it a little bit seen what's going on and then drive to survive it just brought out a lot more stories, which I think have been missing from it. I think the the way it was promoted and whatnot, they just no one want no one wanted to hear any stories apparently. Like, which yeah. is that's why we. I think that's one of the huge parts for me is, you know, what's going on. And it's more human. I think a lot of the teams as well have really taken to the social media thing. They're doing a lot more about, like we were talking about earlier, with the teams and their mechanics and press and what everybody in the team does and how it functions which makes it more human. I think before you just saw a car go around the circuit, a driver get out and deliver something that he'd been told to say, and it all moved on and it got really commercial. Um, and they've kind of headed back the other way with people being able to do their thing and Lewis out doing his stuff. And a lot of them have, you know, Max is obviously quite vocal about maybe not staying around forever. Um, yeah. I think that's quite a I mean, nice doesn't hang place about. to be. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think that's quite a nice place to be. And the fact that like Lando and Max, they spend, hours and hours and hours in the simulator and yeah. just having fun with their mates and that's like it really opens up and makes it personal yeah i think it's really interesting that like those two and i think some of the others do but they do like sim racing and like max is unbelievably good at sim racing as well which i think a lot of people look at and go like oh it's a completely different thing but i think it is a completely different thing even though it's the same and that people can go out and do an online race and max could be racing in that race yeah, how crazy is that? Like, that's just bonkers. There's no, okay, you could do a 100-meter sprint against someone, but they're not going to be there. Um, yeah. like, Usain Bolt's not going to turn up, is No, it? exactly, um, which is, is super cool. You've got a sim here. Do you get much time on the sim? Uh, yeah, so I do some coaching, um, obviously, with all our clients, um, if they're after it while yeah. we're here. Um, and, yeah, we use it as a training tool, um, certainly for circuit learning. Um, and we do do some other bits with some current drivers um, that can just come in and use it um, as a way of prep for their 
like up and coming race weekends. Yeah. Um, and we do run a sort of in-house sim challenge between all the guys here that sort of dips in and out, sort of runs along with a few of the Grand Prix to to see who's fastest. Nice, nice. What, what software are you running? Uh, generally for that, we'll run a set of Corsa because it's tweakable um, and there's a you know huge amount of tracks and, and cars. Have you come up with a, a model for this? We have done it. Um, it's, it's in there. It's not perfect, perfect. Um, but again, I think trying not to get too lost with everybody in the the sim world of it being, as you say, it's, it isn't quite the same. Uh, for us, it's that repetition, consistency, being able to try things like uh, braking and the way you brake and your brake shapes and being able to pull all that data out, which is the same as you would get yeah. from the car and being able to compare the two. Um, seeing the trends in the sim that they do in the car is really interesting and trying to be able to get them out, get it out of them in here. And they're yeah. like, oh, we've, we've had a couple of people that just, it's a computer game, not interested. They're like, look, break like this, do this. And you hammer them. And in the end, they sort of give in and go, all right, I'll do it. And they do it. And as soon as it comes out, the moment they get in the car, it's gone straight away. So it works. It um, is. And that is really interesting. And I, I think there's some people are working on more software that you can sort of tie into these games that will coach you a bit. Yeah. Because that's, I think, one of the things that I find is, I want to get faster and I want to get better at driving. But what do I do? And like, you can learn and learn and learn and learn. But at the same time, you do need someone to go like every now and then. This thing that you do not know anything about. Um, someone told me something the other day that I was like, this is mad. I've never heard of this. Makes sense. Braking. If you slam on the brakes, if you curl your toes off the pedal, that's like literally the smoothest way of reducing anything. Or you can do it the other way yeah. and add a little bit. I'd never, I'd never heard of that, never thought about it. And no. like, now you think about what you're doing with your toes and you're like, hmm, yeah. interesting, tiny difference. It's an interesting one. Um, yeah, can't say I've ever done that. No, we, we, try, try have it. to give it a go. Try it, try it in the road car. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I think, that, I think that's the other thing as well, like being able to get in the sim and teach people left foot braking is yeah, 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 yeah. like, a nice thing to be able do to you do. Have, you have, presumably you have to in these cars? Yeah, clutches are on the steering wheel. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you can't get around the steering column. The, the pedals sit and the column is down the middle. So you, you even if you wanted you to. You have a choice. No. And are most people, do you, are they left foot braking before they drive something like this? About a 50-50 split. Um, some of them do, some of them don't, depends what they race. Um, but I think generally now, if, if guys have gone and done um, GT3, you know, they're all into yeah like they're all set up that way now so it is becoming easier a few years ago it was more difficult everyone was just oh i'm not doing it it's like well you don't have any choice you have to <laughs> try yeah yeah <laughs> it didn't stop no funny story no. <laughs> yeah and i think actually driving stuff like this where you've got to hit you've got to hit the pedals hard mm -hmm. like actually that's one of the things that if you try and left at braking for the first time on the road, isn't it? You always just like put yourself through the windscreen. <laughs> yeah. But you, it's not going to happen in one of these. And you might actually be like, oh, that was, that was a decent amount of braking force there. Let's just do it again and hit a bit harder. Yeah, absolutely. It's that like, it's just that the headspace of building on that. And again, the sim allows you to do the, all the speed piece, although you're not really in the car, that repetition of how quickly the corners come up and that kind of stuff. You can get that all out of the way before actually scaring yourself to death in... Yeah. whatever it might be even like the sr3 is a quick bit of kit really yeah um you know people will soon get themselves quite scared in one yeah the less you have to think about the better <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely and this same the steering wheel our steering wheel has got a million buttons on it but only about six of them are useful um and that's initially we did a six eight button steering wheel um and because it was functional it was easy um and everybody went oh it's it's an F1 car, it should have loads of buttons on it. It's, it's got not enough buttons. Okay, fine. We literally just stuck buttons on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so now we've got loads of buttons that can all operate and we can make them customizable to exactly what each owner wants. Um, but only six or eight of them work for like overboost and radio and pit limiter and that kind of what stuff. What sort of things do you can you control from the steering wheel? So for us, we just have um we have like push to pass, which is when we're not running on the full power modes, it'll give you full power for an amount of time. Okay. Um pit limiter, radio. Uh, scrolling through the pages up and down um, and there's a neutral button in there as well um, and there's a little bit of capability to if we wanted to do certain other things for marking data or some more sort of slightly more complicated stuff we can do that but, but you've not got like any sort of active systems like diff or whatever no we've got rotaries for doing the power modes but generally 
um, especially the guys, you know, it's still a young product for, for us really, we're a year three business. Yeah. And, and the first year was COVID. So great. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, the, um, we have a, we have the option to put the power modes on a rotor on the steering wheel so you can change up yeah. to 600 and back as you see fit through the course of the run. Um, but actually most of the guys, uh, one 450 is fast enough. Uh, you can tell them when they go out, this is on 600 and they come back and they're like, oh, it's crazy. And you go, I've got another 150 break yet. Oh, <laughs> mind blown. Um, which is really good fun. Um, but yeah, they uh, generally will just, it's quick enough. They want to go and play with it, but it's on the overboost button so they can have the full 600 on demand when they want it. Yeah. Um, so on the straights or whatever. Yeah. 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 That's that, any sort of traction control, anything like that? Nope. No TC, no OBS. It's doable. We've got, um, we have the capability for auto pull away, anti stall. Um, traction control can be done, um, but you know, they didn't have it in period. So. Yeah, man. Not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get on with it. <laughs> and, and is it quite easy to pull away with the, the hand clutch? Yeah, and that's all completely mappable as well. Um, so we've got it on quite a, a wide scope to make it as easy as possible. Um, but depending on the, the driver, we can, we can map them into all sorts of funky shapes if they want to. Nice. So you're not just going fizz, 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 fizz off, then slammed shut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Head by the steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very cool thing. And working on the older cars, when someone turns up, someone's bought a car, and they go, can you get it running or look after it or whatever? Is there like a quite a big sort of like almost like research phase at the beginning to make sure it's all there and all the right bits and they all would work together and whether you need to plug in an old laptop yeah, certainly the fully original stuff. We try and do our homework with the teams as best as we can. Um, the ones that are around now that generally are fully original, which are few and far between really, um, tend to come with quite a good amount of like background paperwork and that kind of stuff that helps you to prove or not prove. Um, the rest of them, yeah, we do a big research process. We, uh, before we run anything, we will crack test everything. Um, there are some other people that don't tend to head that route, but especially as we're getting into more carbon cars, stuff you can't see. Yeah. Um, even with the metallic components, you know, titanium's great until it's not and then it's broken. Um, and it doesn't give you any cracks or stress fractures or any of that kind of stuff. It's just done. So being able to test everything to get a good look at it is, is key. So from a safety aspect, you know, we will go through them in the same way that an F1 team does um, and make sure they go back together right and they've got all the right componentry in. And then, yeah, if we have to re-engineer and make bits up to go in the middle to join the dots for things that might be missing, um, we'll do as much research as possible to, from imagery or speaking to people that worked on them, um, if that's possible. Um, yeah, and try and get as close as we can to it or something that looks remarkably similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, When yeah. with, like, crack testing, how do, how do they crack test it? Is it x-ray? Uh, yeah, there's a few different ways from ultrasonic um, and uh, x-raying and, and the guys have, yeah, I mean, the guys that we use have got the and like unbelievable kit. It's nerdy as anything, but you can get to the point where you can look at all the individual layers of carbon in the layout. Oh, nice. So you can start at the bottom and work your way through to see where you are. So um, yeah, especially with the carbon suspension and stuff, it's important to, to try and stay on top of that. Um, so you don't have any sillies, but yeah, it's, uh, it, the amount of things that sometimes you'll pick up, you uh, suspension clevis looks mint, just been recoated, looks like brand new. Could even be new old stock and you'll crack test it and there'll be a hairline fracture in there somewhere. If you run it, it'll probably be fine for two test days and, then, it's it, not. and then it'll be in the wall, yeah. So then with, with things like carbon suspension and stuff like that, are you then crack testing it every now and then? So on, on the TDF one, obviously all the front ends are carbon on these. Yeah. Um, and we, uh, we crack test before they go. Um, we know via the team what the original mileages were um, or people that we know. Um, and so then generally, so we do 3,000 kilometers between ma major services. Um, obviously, they get looked after like a race car in the meantime. Um, but at 1,500 kilometers, we'll do a, a front end inspection on the car with uh, ultrasonic um, and just make sure they're okay yeah um and then uh and then yeah three they they'll get done again and if they have any big impacts we've got a little recorder in the car if they have any like excessive impacts on curbs or bumps or where they've been off the road or if they have a small prang somewhere it's it's all got to come off and be checked okay and have you got full telemetry in uh, the cars 
yeah, so we log as much as, we've tried to make it easy for the running side of stuff, but we log everything in the background. So the driver stuff gets pulled out through VBox. Yeah. Um, we've got our own T-cam that sits on the top, looks like the F1, like T-cams, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but houses a V-box. Um, so we can pull all the driver stuff out and from a driver side, it's really easy. And then we, in the background, we log everything else for engine gearbox and all the other systems. And what does it, what's it cost? What does it cost to buy a car? So they start at 1.25. Um, and then from there, really, you can kind of either go as mad or as not as you want. Um, so the car comes with a whole heap of equipment to be able to run it rather than... We looked at other motorsport derived stuff and it's like, there's the car, it's a million quid. And it's like, okay, cool. What, what do I get? What do I run it with? Oh, well, if you want something to start it, it's 10 grand. And if you right, want a yeah, laptop, yeah. it's another eight grand. And if you want this, you know. whereas we deliver with laptop, tooling, stands, quick jacks, uh, you know, as much kit as yeah, you want. Yeah, and then yeah. we, we can go as far as set up equipment, race trucks, your own team wear, boarding, gantries, overheads, uh, literally as much as you want. Or I just want the car, I've got my own team. Um, can you come and train them, which we can go and do? Um, or one of our other partners. Um, and we can just deliver the car out and get you on circuit. Yeah, that is, that is quite nice. Because I can imagine, you know, most of the people will have got other cars. They might be based at the, in a fancy club in America or whatever. Um, and they're like, well, I want one of those, but I don't want to be going down something being like, oh, have we got this size spanner or whatever? Just like send the stuff to these people. Yep, comes in a flight case. Just open it up, it's in there, close the flight case. Leads, laptops, everything is there. We'll do the, the training necessary with people that are running it. Although a lot of the guys obviously look for us to come and run the car, which we yeah. can do. But because you don't need to fly 20 people to run the car, two of us can hop on a plane almost next day. Yeah, that's be very out there, simple. run it, come back, and it doesn't cost huge amounts of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they know they've got the support from us. Likewise, if it's running at Thermal or it's running down in Australia with the guys down there, they've all been trained with us um, and they can get on with it. And if they need any remote support, they can just dial in and we can be on the end of the phone or the end of the laptop, whatever. And do people run quite a big spares package? Uh, a mix. Um, the further away they are, they tend to obviously have a little bit more, but again, we can reproduce all the items for the car. So should it end up in the fence at some point, you know, whether that be suspension or crash structures or wings or anything, we can reproduce all of that. And how quickly can you turn that stuff around? I imagine people are not that fast, but you know, if I turn in and gone, oh, I've gone and done a front end, can I have a new one, please? Suspension takes a bit of time, it takes a bit of time to lay up and they're obviously not on rose joints, they're on flex joints. So I'll show you in the workshop, but they're basically, a, rather than rotating around a joint, they just have a, a tuned machined piece of titanium on the Mauritius that flexes. Oh, right, okay. so, and that's, so that, that side of stuff and bonding that all together takes a bit of time. But from, from body work, you know, crash structures and nose cones, we can have them out in, you know, 14 days probably. Maximum. That's pretty good. Because that's, that's definitely got to be one of the most annoying things about running older cars. And I know from people running like cars at Le Mans and whatever, the sort of historic stuff, you just can't get parts, like, or there are none. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, with modern technology and being out, you're saying you 3D scan everything. Yeah. Um, can you make, well, with these, obviously you can make everything. Happy days. You're yeah. never going to get a situation where we can't fix it and get it running again. You're not going to have to go... We've got this tiny part, but um, there are none of them and no one else wants to buy one. So we're going to have to make a hundred and it's going to cost me an obscene amount of money and it's going to take six months or whatever. Yeah. Is, it, is it much better now with running the other uh, cars, what you can get and make? Yeah, I mean, so we, we are building a catalog now of, you know, full car scans um, right. and for people that we work with, especially on the work side, like you say, the older cars, um, you know, I would really encourage people to, um, if you, no matter what it is, whether it's a sports car or a, uh, you know, a LMP car, GT car, single seater, whatever it is that you might be racing, um, or road car, um, come and scan it. We'll scan it. Um, because the data actually, it's not a hugely expensive thing to, especially just doing an exterior scan or yeah. big panel scans, you know, bonnets or, you know, the radical, the whole front clam yeah. scan. Okay difficult because you can you can find radical but for people that can't um getting that data isn't difficult and it can just sit we then don't need to do anything with it um we don't need to turn it into a 3d model we don't need to make molds it can just sit 
in the cloud. Um, and then should the worst happen at some point, you know you can pick the phone up and go, all right, I've ripped the front end off it. And we can go, okay, cool. Well, now it's going to cost this. We can turn it into a mold. We can get our carbon guys to knock it out or whoever. It can be hand beaten somewhere or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, we go from there. Um, but it just gives you that peace of mind that it's... And it's specific for your car. You're not like, oh, I've, there's someone else somewhere that's got the same car. Can you... I'm going to send someone to your house. Can they scan the front of your car? Yeah. And then it comes back and you know, it doesn't quite fit. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or, and likewise, some of this stuff, trying to get access to yeah. another one, it just might not happen. Or you'd have to pull some big favors or potentially spend a lot more money than just taking the data. Yeah, and if there's not many of a car, I, I think most people are quite friendly about this sort of stuff. They like to see people racing a lot. But if, you, if there was two and yeah. you crashed yours yeah. and the other person was like, well, if your car never gets built again, Mine's worth more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, there are, you know, there are, I mean, Goodwood, you know, there's replicas of GT40s, 250s, yeah. that kind of stuff around. Um, and I think it's the way it will go, certainly with the aluminium tub stuff, the carbon tub stuff is completely copyable. We could make another one tomorrow. It won't come with the racing history, yeah. but it's doable, but it's expensive. Um, and it kind of takes away from the, the flavor of it. But for guys that have got MP44s or something yeah. like that surely you've got to be looking towards okay center drove it still got the engine center drove in the back of it i really need to not be breaking this thing or getting into a position where something happens that's outside your control you're on a demo and a, a rabbit runs out yeah. and you rip the front wing off whatever or it's being loaded it's been pushed around and someone just drives absolutely. into it yeah yeah absolutely right so um that kind of situation is like fully protectable from and that's why we do what we do and then we can reverse engineer back so for us obviously most of the bits are here but we can take that car apart and every component that comes off all those individual little bolts we can scan them photograph them catalog them yeah and we know that if someone drops it and it goes down the drain we can just pull it off the cloud and you know silly things like that um or or st stupid stuff we've had before when you travel you are in the workshop you send the car and you go ah oh, I need to say that with me. Put it in your backpack, get to security. Security are like, mm, don't like that. Take it yeah. off you. You're like, cool. That's the only one. Yeah, that's, there's no more of those. We can't make any more. I don't know what it looked like. <laughs> but it's just this size. Wasn't measured. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but that gives us that capability. And that's what we're trying to sort of, it's like an education piece. It's a bit like safety. There's a lot of people running around or have done in the past with belts that have still got 95 date on, no, yeah. no working fire extinguishers. Yeah, but they're original. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, Keep them at home, and we'll go and run the car. And then when you come and when you come to sell it, you can sell it with the original components again. As the values are going up on some of these cars, and they, they I feel like they haven't for a while. Maybe certain Ferraris or whatever, but like they're going up now. And as you said, people want to see them, or maybe you get them run every now and then. Are people starting to sort of replace the car? As in, you take the engine out, leave the engine at home because it's the engine that won and we're going to put in a very similar or identical not not to the same like okay we're not going to put in a turbo four or whatever but are people doing more of that and then they're like oh actually this carbon tub like it is in one piece but if it got a hole in the side of it yeah it's not anymore yeah. it's not anymore <laughs> yeah i think um the, the carbon stuff is still coming certainly the like 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s F1 stuff has gone mad. Um, and the, the money they're spending, racing masters, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Building, um, there are some Tyrrell continuations, the six wood Tyrrells, um, that were officially like blessed by Tyrrell. They've got continuation numbers on and they are brand new build six wood Tyrrells. Okay. Arguably not eligible to actually go to Monaco yeah. and race in the classic, but they should be. Um, they're perfect. And the people that, you know, will buy them should be able to go and race them. Likewise, I know with Lamar, people that own 917s, they're looking at people doing, uh, you can, provided you can prove you own the original, you can go and build another 917 and race that because you're 20 million pound 917, you don't want to crash. Yeah. Um, they, these aren't quite there yet. And I think people are still a little bit scared of the carbon thing um, because it's so unusual and they're not quite sure how far you can go with it. Obviously as well, like the chances are you can crash it 15 times over and not really do any particular damage. Yeah. Um, it's also so much safer. Absolutely, you are going faster. Well, actually, no, you're not, not necessarily, necessarily going faster. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. I think it will come, and it's just we're in a position of like come and throw questions at us, talk to us about it because yeah. we've either probably done it or are doing it, or it's 
been in the pipeline, you know, as I say, the 19 car, Halo era car running that project. Um, you know, we are thinking up the road to where we are now. We're still pushing, uh, leaning on our network in current F1 and trying to stay in that, you know, what is at the forefront, what's coming next. Um, yeah. You were saying with, um, with the Halos, a lot of people, now that we all know Halos are a really good thing, people want to put them on their older cars. Is it is it viable? Are they... no, I mean, the we've been asked all the time, um, and the the intricacies in the chassis. Uh, maybe that's something we should do a video on. Oh, but the <laughs> the intricacies in the chassis that they have to put in to withstand the load should it end up upside down or or a wheel hit it or something are uh, huge. The whole chassis is completely different. Um, we could bolt one on, but the chances are when you roll, it will just push its way through the chassis and then right. you're in a worse state than you would have been in the first place. Yeah, then you've got a halo squashing you rather than yeah. not. Yeah, absolutely. So it, is, it isn't doable. We did it for, a, in fact, the car up here has got, um, we did a Chemical Brothers music video and that halo, that's the 2011 Sauber and that halo is just a carbon fiber. Um, we did it off a scan and made it ourselves just because it needed to look right for the video. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then just took it straight back off again afterwards. Um, but yeah, you couldn't do it properly. Ah, interesting. And do you think that presumably, will that push some people away from driving older F1 cars? If, if, if newer ones start to become available, which we don't know whether they will or what, or eventually, but... Uh, I don't know, you'd say that, but then you look at the hooligans running around in minis at Goodwood and... You know, yeah, and like old F1 cars with like don't even have seatbelts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've driven an 85 Tolman, um, a first turbo era thing, nuts. What is that like? Uh, insane. Um, just no boost and then all the boost and then no boost again. Um, but they, you know, the, the dampers sit under your legs so you can't let your calves rest because you get pinched in the springs and you can't <laughs> go up because the steering rack sits across. So I did like five laps of Goodwood or something. And my shins were just black and blue for like, oh. you know, two weeks. Ridiculous. But how <laughs> they drove them in the day, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, you know, I've got uh, friends that have driven, you know, pre-war stuff, gears on the outside. And yeah. Yeah, crazy. But I think there'll always be someone that wants to go and pedal on. There will. will. And I, I think there's a, I don't know whether other people would agree with this, but like I, I have my own personal sort of time in history of when I kind of started getting into it. Um, and before that is old or older. Yeah. But from that time on, that is like current kind of, you know, mm -hmm. like, and if I was born, if I was 80 now, the things that I thought were like supercars and whatever at the, when I was 20, I'd still be like, yeah, but they were the, the yes. latest, greatest things. Yeah, They're yeah. still awesome. Whereas when you look back, you're like, yeah, things have evolved a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm kind of used to a certain amount of safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the point. And that's why I think like this sort of V10 era, 90s, early 2000s era is really starting to sort of get in front of people now. And it's inter the market's all interesting because, um, you know, there's a lot of people that maybe didn't have a lot of interest in F1, have got into it via Netflix and all the bits mm. we're speaking about. Um, and are now in a fortunate enough position, wealthy enough to be able to get involved with it. And so it's kind of changing the market a bit. Some cars go for quite good money. Some you're like, oh, it's quite cheap for what it is really. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then other cars out of nowhere will suddenly be like, well, what went mad? Um, and it's just what catches people at the right time. And um, yeah, it is, it is an interesting one. I think a lot of people are looking back and going, oh, I remember even if they weren't involved in like motorsport at all, but you see it in the newspaper. On yeah, the news. You yeah, look yeah, back yeah. and you go, oh, I, was a, I remember seeing that when I was a kid or whatever. And that's just starting to become a thing. And also wealth has become uh, sort of a younger man's thing in a, to a younger, younger generation thing in general. Um, you know, the access to be able to spend a million quid on a hybrid yeah. car is now, you can do that or people can do it in their twenties, which never used to be a thing yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting looking at, thinking about like what you said, you see a car racing on TV, like an F1 car. There's a possibility you can buy that car. It's not like when you walk around in the street and you're like, oh, I've seen a GT car racing. I can buy a GT3. It's like, no, 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 no. You can buy that exact car. Yeah. Which is kind of mad when you think about it. Like, this was that. Any old footage, especially if the, that, does that add some va value in some cars? Cars that there is footage of that you can see 
someone doing a lap. Does that, is that a differentiator in values at all or is it more just like? That's definitely a lot of who's driven it. Um, yeah. The footage can do, there's a car we're building at the moment. Uh, it's not actually here at the moment, it's a way um, having some work done, but it's, um, that's due back from having the exhausts done. And that was a Villeneuve car. It's the last Williams to carry the number one. Um, but that ended its racing life uh, in the wall backwards at the top of Eau Rouge, mm. um, big time. Um, and they repaired it, they went testing afterwards. You know, well, we've obviously been through the car, it's fine. And that's now gonna go back on circuit again. But yeah. the, the video of it in a big ball of like snot at the top of Eau Rouge and Villeneuve just kind of climbing out and going, well, that was cool. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's just, a, it's just another cool thing to go with the car. I think probably for the right collector, that probably adds even more. Do you think that person's interested in taking it to Spa? I hope so. <laughs> he's, so he's, uh, he is looking at, uh, runs a race team uh, in the US and is like, I've always wanted to do the F1 thing. This is his first foray into that. Yeah. Um, and he's like, I want to go to Suzuka. I want to do Spa. I want to go to Monza. He wants to drive around Sebring in it, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like he's just looking at going and driving them at the, all the cool venues, Silverstone. Oh yeah, 100%. That would be, that's the dream, isn't it? get a legit F1 car or any F1 car to be honest and drive it at places you've seen on TV. Yeah, how cool. Imagine like just hacking around Suzuka and just like, oh, that's cool. This yeah. did this 25 years ago. <laughs> that was not a bad day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's the, um, if you're looking at, at buying an F1 car, how are sort of values doing? Where, where's the value? What's, what's gone crazy and what does crazy look like? What Like numbers and then are there still cars that are relatively speaking cheap? Yeah, I mean the 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 crazy numbers are the obvious, the Senna's, the Schumacher's, especially original cars, you know, and a lot of them are contained within Cliente. Obviously, um, McLaren offloaded a, a chunk of their cars a few years ago. They yeah. sort of mortgaged them all off. Um, so there's a few of them out there now. Um, you know, the Raikkonen cars, that kind of you know, like beautiful McLaren yeah. sort of era. Um, the the ones with the real names, champion names against them, championship winning era cars. Um, but a lot of them get scooped up into private collections. And, and are they like millions or tens of millions or depending on? Depends. Like the like a Schumacher Senna car can go flying through 10 million easy. Um, I think there was a Lewis car sold for something like 7 million a couple of years ago. Um, and the, again, it's all moved on again because people are like, oh, I want one in my collection. Yeah. Um, I've seen it on the TV. I, I want to go and buy one. Um, but then there, is, there are cars around that you look at and they're not silly money. You know, it, I mean, the V10 stuff 15 years ago was 100 grand, 150 grand for a running car. That's insane. Um, and now they're not, they're heading north. But, they're, but again, you know, the V10 era stuff, because people are still a bit scared of them, you can pick up a, a running car for, I don't know, 400, 500, 600,000 in that window. Which that seems like, you know, it's a lot of money, but it seems like relative to, let's talk about other cars, other things, yeah. road cars, whatever, like it's not. And, and, you know, we have the same conversation again. They're like, well, I'll buy a V10 then rather than TDF1. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Once you bought that V10, it does 300 kilometers to an engine rebuild and an engine rebuild could be 100, 150 grand, <laughs> you know? So, and, wow. then, and then you need all the bits and kit to run it and the move valves on there you can't get anymore. So the moment they fail, you have to do a new hydraulic system. That could be 60 grand. If the if the wiring has any issues because it's 30 years old, the ECUs are, you know, you've got one on the car. If you want to go and find another step six Morelli ECU, go for it. But it's going to cost you 20 grand to go and find one if you can find one. And most of them have been scooped up by Ferraris. So they can keep looking after their cars because they tapped on our door not that long ago yeah. to go, have you got any of these? I'm like, uh no we've we've got one <laughs> but like it's not going anywhere it's got a couple of a noughts on it <laughs> yeah you know and so like that whole thing is that's where the pain then comes you'll you go smashing and again they then need to scan it they need, need to go through all that process that you very easily get north of where we are yeah um and it's it's just that education piece going like you know some of them putting new tethers on and new safety devices new fire extinguishers seat belts all the little bits new fuel tanks because they're obviously five year homologated and some of them have been in the car for 20 years people are like yeah but they don't leak it's like you know, it's gonna at some point and and if it does <laughs> yeah it's gonna get real hot real fast <laughs> so yeah like trying to just do all those bits so, so it's it's swings and roundabouts but yeah they aren't 
you know, they're not terrible money, really. But running costs, that's it. We, I guess when you look at these cars and you go, it, it costs X, whatever it costs to, to buy it. You go, what was this team spending a year to run this car? Yeah, and that's it, right? And you need, you know, that they take two or three hours to get it warm in the morning, get them fired up with hydraulics rigs and heaters. You need three of us can do it, but really you should do it for transport, all those bits and pieces. You, when you fly the engines, they definitely need to come out with the V10 stuff, ideally, the sort of the more highly strong stuff anyway, the 18,000 RPM, 90,000 RPM stuff. They get a bit touchy to moisture. And <laughs> so you get into all that, like it just, they are great. And I applaud absolutely everybody that's got one because I'd have one in a heartbeat. I've driven a couple of the V10 stuff and they Sick. are just oh, sublime, but they are a massive headache. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's why I think like, you see these things and you're like, there's not that many people running stuff like this because you've got to go, I want to do this. Yeah. And I've got a lot of cash, but I'm, I want to do this and I, can, and I can get it going. And you can do it on a budget. Like if the car comes here, we do all our crack test stuff, we're happy with it. You know, we run clients' cars where they're not, they're not you know, out to spend a million quid a year running a car. Great, we're going to do British Grand Prix demo, all the rest of it. But the caveat comes with if you go to the event and we've had it in the past and you fire the car up the night before, it's great, you come in the morning, preheat it, you get it all running. You get 10 minutes before you get in the car and a sensor fails. Well, you haven't got any spares. Yeah. Um, and we can't run it with, you know, like the air valve engine stuff. You can't run it with an air valve sensor that's not working because it will blow itself to pieces. And then you're into your 150 grand engine rebuild. So then your day out becomes, oh, well, I can't do my demo. Yeah. And that purely comes down to what client wants to do. We can have as many spares as you like and be able to quickly switch that out, plug the laptop in, sort it out, get back out. Um, but they have to spend the money up front to do that. And it's just, it's just a different way. Of, it's the same with everything. Big, bigger budgets, lesser budgets. Yeah, and it's, I think you, you see it in definitely in all of the like Peter Auto and stuff like that, um, where the people are running these cars. The majority of people run cars that are known to be pretty reliable and there's tons of spares and there's also other cars of the same manufacturer there. Like I remember I was going to one event and one of the guys running a, I think it was like a 996 RS R type thing. Yep. And had a spark plugs like nuke themselves, but didn't have any more. And you're like, right, well, this could be your whole weekend gone. Yeah. Luckily there was someone else running a 996 RS and they had some, and they're like, I don't know, 1,200 pounds each or something ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're all right. Whereas you do see sometimes people running like the, the more interesting niche manufacturers or maybe like a, a pro drive Ferrari or whatever, things that you know that when things start to go wrong, the bills get high, but also the, just the availability of parts is lower. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the 98 Minardi that we've got, you know, you, if you roll up to an event with that, the, there, there aren't any others. So you're on your own. Um, and if we can run it, you know, it's fine. And it does, it makes a lot of noise, makes a lot of people pretty happy, especially the guy that owns it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, occasionally there'll be those little faults. Um, and you can go to town if, you know, we would encourage somebody to go across all the important bits, all the important sensors and stuff and go, right, we'll go and buy one of all of these things. Yeah. Like the, the big stuff, we'll put it away, but they are expensive, um, you know. And as long as they don't, just expire, which presumably a lot of stuff doesn't. Especially the electronic stuff, generally not. Um, the difficulty is, you know, like say with the ECUs and, and that kind of stuff, they can be, if they have a wobble, um, you go <laughs> bottom of the list with, you turn up at Morelli with a little box in your hand and go, uh, can you look after that? And they go, yeah, yeah, but we, you know, we've got Le Mans, we've got all these other series that we're involved in and, and you got a, an old car that we don't really care about. So yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it at some point and it was going to cost quite a bit of money, but I think that's also part of the allure of it. It's like old in, like yeah, say yeah, the yeah. Peter Orte stuff or classic road cars. Like part of the thing is every now and again, you're going to come out of the shop and try and turn it on and it won't start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it just depends on how much you've got riding on it, I guess, and your tolerance for risk. Then you just choose what you're going to do or you take multiple cars and yeah, I mean, that's carry what, as many spares as possible. We are probably, I probably shouldn't say it and say it, I'm brutally honest with everybody about it in that, the, it's the only way to be. This is how they are. They are temperamental, but everyone would have one yeah. because they are epic. They are. Um, you know, and that's why we did, like I said, that's why we did what we did with the TDF1. And 
wound it back out the other way so that you can go and have the enjoyment still in an F1 car and not have to just take that little bit of worry about, about yeah. if, you know, if a sensor goes down, it's five minutes. If the engine fails, generally when we're on test, we have a whole spare rear end with us. We can, in two hours, you'll be back out. It's that kind of yeah. piece which we provide the support for. And you're, you're getting a very similar at least perform performance level experience in single seater crazy f1 vibe to running something that's significantly more difficult and maybe you run both but at least it's just pretty much it's going to fire up and off you go yeah and arguably you drive it faster you land up lapping will, quicker yeah. because you've got that you know what it's like when you drive around you're like oh, i really can't afford to bend it this week yeah. it's it's uh you you always lose five percent whereas if they can go out and be closer to their limit it's more enjoyable anyway the cheaper a car is the faster i drive it higher cars higher cars yeah the fastest race cars on the planet <laughs> and you notice that in the paddock when if if money means less to someone you often see them they're more committed the risk yeah yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely <laughs> especially when they're coming near your car yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, get out of the way but that's part of the game though right like getting inside people's heads yeah that's just part of it if they know you're coming and it might just arrive up the inside and you know you can get inside their head even if you haven't got the money you've just got to get it in there it's in that side of driving is really interesting like the psychology of like position car sort of like almost like the language of the car of how you yeah. move the car and whatever you can tell straight away that some people if you just like are quite aggressive with them you know that's it they, they backed off once and they're just gonna let you pass the yeah. the for the rest of the day yeah the moment uh the moment you're behind them and you see the glance in the mirror you're like got you <laughs> this is dumb <laughs> unless you get your like i mean there's so many examples but like your lewis max around oh, the outside and they'd it. be like no yeah yeah try it not today yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't have to worry about paying to fix it so no but they do they, they get annoyed if they uh I, I can't imagine you want to be in a 170 mile an hour crash into a solid object no absolutely no no <laughs> they, can, they can keep those right well i normally wrap these up with five questions do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey or i guess possibly time in a car um i mean i've been we've sat here all after like all morning afternoon chatting about um i've been driving this driving that which is the most big headed ridiculous thing to ever say but i've been really lucky to drive some f1 cars which i started off as a mechanic in F1, so to be able to have gone and driven them is like That's so cool. ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I think all of them are equally crazy. For me personally, winning, like hopping straight into my Formula Renault stuff and winning championships in that was like a bit ludicrous and it's cool. really cool. Um, but yeah, the F1, driving any of the F1 stuff, the, to be able to put your suit and stuff on and hop into one is, is a cool experience. Yeah, yeah. Proper pinch yourself, mad bucket list stuff. Yeah, and like half the time it's for a shakedown or for a purpose. So you're in like full focus mode, needs to do this, needs to do that, develop this. You know, what we're looking at, is it damping or blah, blah, blah. So you go through all that stuff and you get out afterwards and you're like, oh, cool. And you come in and you have some lunch stuff and you sit there and you think, it's been a ridiculous morning. <laughs> <laughs> this is just stupid. Um, and people trust in, you know, I think for me as well, the trust people show in allowing me to go and drive their cars mm. um, is, uh, yeah, always makes it just, yeah, it's a nice feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Uh, if you could only drive one car for the rest of your life, sports car, what would it be? That's a big question. Um, I, I am a, a Porsche fan. Um, mm -hmm. So I have to head towards a GT3. Um, I've not been in the new one, um, but I've got to head in that direction. A GT3 of some sort, 991, 992. I just think nice. you can hop in it every day. Manual, PDK? Oh, heart says manual, lap time says PDK. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? Oh, TDF1, obviously. TDF1, obviously. No, yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. I actually think, um, and again, this is a bit Porsche orientated, but the Cayman GT4s, I think like, on the market second hand, you can get in one for less than a 4S, Grand yeah. 4S. It's nuts. The performance is unbelievable. Yeah, they are really good. So I think they're pretty nuts. Um, 
I think in terms of, and I know they're huge money, but I think the appreciation of people around like Koenigsegg, mm. I think they should, they almost deserve to be 10 times the price. They are unbelievable kit. Um, they are I, another level. Yeah. I think the things they're doing um, and the way they're going about it is just outrageous. But again, I also know they're about 2 million quid. So. <laughs> they are. But then if you buy, okay, you've got to be able to buy it. So you know, that's not very many people, but, and they're, the, any of them are worth like basically a million more than you paid for it now. Yeah. Which as a manufacturer, I mean, that's happy, happy, happy days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like dream level. If you were going to put that on your, I'm going to start a business that I'm going to yeah. do, if that would be like top of the list, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can sell, you're like, well, you, if you don't like it, you can sell it and someone will give you more money. You're like, oh, I mean, perfect. Oh, where do I sign? Where do I, <laughs> how many do I need to buy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the most interesting car to you at the moment? What are you Googling, looking up, researching? Oh. Um, uh, I don't know actually. Like the, I end up looking at stuff here most of the time. Yeah. Um, but I think, like road car wise, there's there's a whole ton of like the resto mod stuff. Mm. That I think is quite cool. Uh, Revolution is it with the E type? Yeah. E Evolution. Rather. Evolution. Yeah. Evolution. I think they're kind of like it's quite a cool take on something a bit different. Yeah. They, they look epic as well. Um. But yeah, road car wise, I don't know. I feel like it's that kind of sportness again, having done like uh, either driven on circuit, like even like you say, like driving the Radicon circuit kind of ruins road cars a little bit. It does, 100%. You know, slicks and that whole thing. Um, I think getting like and going to Gestad with uh, Supercar in a circle and stuff was another like road trip experience was ridiculous. Um, and you see so much of everything. I think there were four Chinkrays there or something, which yeah. is like. Mad. so getting to see all that stuff is cool so you kind of find i end up like just trying to find out more about it because you see stuff and you're like what even is it like it's the pagani but what I don't understand. yeah and actually if like, you're spending so much time with like the top end of automotive engineering like in terms of materials and stuff like that so presumably those road cars as well you start to see similar sorts of stuff in things like that so they're sort of in a nerd and you must yeah, yeah, yeah. geek like, out massively like like that just out event spent forever talking to christian about his carbon wheels mm. and he was talking to us about what we're doing which is really cool um he's a, just a genius but the being able to talk about how they manufacture their stuff and he was talking about some projects that he's looking at in the future which was cool um and uh yeah we just told him to stay out of making single seat race cars <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Stay back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, five car garage, unlimited value. Oh. Well, there's a Koenigsegg of some sort in there. Um, I like the Regera, but the gearbox slightly annoys me. Yeah, I can 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 get behind it. Yeah, it's just if we chuck a manual in it. Yes, go. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe that's maybe that's a bit more like it. Obviously, a GT3 RS or something along those lines. Uh, Slightly left field. My first car was a Saxo. Right. I would absolutely love another Saxo because nice. I just drive the wheels off it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and they don't exist anymore. Like, <laughs> I just never see them. Um, one of these. One of these. Um, oh, one more. I feel like you'd need something like to just waft along in a Bentley, rangy, something that was just all the comfort. Yeah, yeah, maybe a Bentley. Yeah, because when you when you're driving to the track to get in your F1 car, you want to arrive fresh, right? You want to like you're not racing anyone. No, you're just gonna get there. Thank you very much. Absolutely, and you can hop out fresh the other end, having yeah. just had a massage from the seats. Yeah, because there's nothing like driving fast, even slow cars fast, but on track, especially with other people, that really kills you. Like your brain is fried. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And then that's the point, right? You want to be able to get back out and then get back into your massage seat yeah. and see what's in the cool box. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. No, thanks for coming and seeing us.